Thank you, Eric, and good morning, everyone. Just a few announcements. Ladies, you start a new ladies' Bible study this Tuesday um, in the morning for, on First Peter. So if you're not in a ladies' Bible study and would like to be, there's a great time to start. Also, ladies, your uh, monthly social goes this Tuesday over in the Fellowship Hall with the theme of Together. The entire women's ministry team is going to give you the devotion Together, which I think is a great way of doing that. Uh, vacation Bible schools in less than two months, which for us means, A, we need you signed up for, to be leaders, and I think we pretty much have all those leaders. The first leadership training goes this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday in the Fellowship Hall. If you can't make that one, then we ask that you come on May 11th. Those are mandatory because we want to get everybody on the same sheet of music, uh, so please uh, do that. Next Sunday morning... We're having a name tag Sunday slash guest reception. So here's how that works. Name tags. We, we're going to have them available, and we want you to fill them out and wear them. Now, why are we doing that? So that people know your name. So they can call you by name. That's, a, that's really important. If I say, hey, brother, hey, sister, it's probably because I forgot your name. And with over 600 members, it's really hard to learn everybody's name. I'm going to work really hard to learn five to ten new names that I don't already have in, in the brain housing group there. And then every week try to go up to those four or five people and say, hi, good to see you again, and, and mention their name. That it helps to build some camaraderie. Also that day, we're having a guest reception. So the way that works is if you're new to Centerview or a new member to Centerview or you've never been to a guest reception and want to come, after the second hour service, we'll have a meal for you. I think Brother Earl's making hamburgers and hot dogs. And then we're going to have some sides brought in by one of the Sunday school classes. But we're going to have a meal for you, and then we're going to have an opportunity to talk to Pastor Mike and the staff members to be able to answer any questions that you have about Centerview and what we do and why we're here so that we can all, once again, get on the same sheet of music. So please uh, join us for that. Also, next Sunday evening, we have two things. We have another baptism next Sunday. We have three to four scheduled for this morning also. But we have a, a Heavenly Father's business meeting 
that we're doing for next Sunday evening to allow Eastview to attend because they norm we normally do them on Wednesdays, but their praise team practices on Wednesday. And here's why. You notice I'm not Pastor Mike. He's not here. He's at Eastview this morning preaching for them because today is the one-year anniversary of them opening up, launching as a church, and that's wonderful. <laughs> and the next step is to buy land. And so we're going to make a proposal. They've already got a... They're really well on the way to making this happen. So we want to pre present that to you next Sunday night. Take about five to ten minutes during the service. If you can't attend this service and would like to have any questions, you can contact me during the week, and I'll be glad to answer any of those for you. Operation Christmas Child is also going. This month we're collecting hygiene items. You can uh, bring those out to that large uh, ch Christmas Child box out there in the yeah, Welcome Center. And one last thing I was asked to remind youth parents that the final payment for your child's camp is due by May 26, and you need to start paying uh, if you haven't. And if you have any questions, you can talk to, talk to Brother Joe Moneymaker. He'll be glad to answer those. If you please stand and join us with the praise team. Thank you. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sin against us. Thank you, Praise Team. What a great way to prepare us for prayer time. Uh, that's based on Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's model prayer, and uh, something that we should be using as a structure when we pray. Uh, when we go to the Lord, we ask for His will to be done, and uh, His kingdom to come, and confess sin, and then do the things that we, and thank Him for what He's given us. So our missionary in focus, we have one every every week, uh, and this week, it's Steve and Jen Hagen. They are missionaries to the Philippines. They've been there since 2005. Now, Jen's family was originally missionaries to the Philippines 
to a, a group of people called the Bug Kalot. I think that's how you say it, B-U-G-K-L-L-T. And then when she got married, her and her husband went back to the Philippines, and they wanted to reach an unreached people group, the Agta. And since then, they have moved in with them, and they have uh, sent 20, they've trained 20 other believers in that group to sit, go out to other areas of the Philippines. It's exactly how it's supposed to be. It's wonderful to see how God uh, does those kinds of things. He puts people in our hearts, gives us a call, they go do it, people support them, and then God's word gets out and he gets the glory as people get saved. We serve an extraordinary God who uses ordinary people to, to make things happen. Our verse of the month for, uh, for us to focus on has been 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, your sakes, he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. God humbled himself, became one of us to die in our place so that God could treat us as if we were Christ. He treated Christ as if we were us and uh, laid upon him uh, his wrath. And then fortunately, Lord, he rose from the grave. We got to celebrate that a few weeks ago. He paid the penalty for sin, death, and the grave. And so God demonstrates his love by giving. And we are able to do the same. If you look at our budget, we are above budget. And why is that? Because we understand that you can give and not love God, but you cannot love God and not give. And I love, I love working in a church where people get that. And we're able to bless people. Multiple people this last week we were able to help with various things. Cars breaking down and uh, clearing uh, just physical needs. Um, to help support missions. It's all because you give us that ability to do it, so we're so thankful. Uh, and that, but that's because we serve a great God. As we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, I want us to uh, think about what that song that we just sang. And that song that we just sang focused on the Lord's prayer. And so we do serve a God who is King of kings and, and Lord of lords. He's the one that's in charge. And so there's only one king, and we're not him, or one queen, and you're not her. Um, God's the one in charge. And so as his servants, we have the, uh, the privilege to go to him and ask him for everything. And he's so, he's so wonderful to provide it. But we need to do with a heart that's right, not only with God, but with other people. In fact, in Matthew 5, there's a warning. It says, if you come before the Lord with your gift and you know that somebody has something against you, go and make it right with that person and then come back and worship God. See, we can't worship God appropriately if we're not right with each other and I can't worship and I can't be right with you if I'm not right with God and so there's always that that paradox that we have to be right with God if I love God and love others life's a lot easier the problem is I love myself too much and that kind of messes it up and so then we have to confess our sins so let's go to our Lord uh, and asking him for his grace Lord you're so thankful to us we're so thankful for your goodness to us and Lord is if I'm honest and if I look at my own heart, Lord, uh, I'm the chief of sinners. And yet, Lord, you love me enough to send your son to die for me, to send uh, your spirit to convict my heart, to send people who love you in a faraway land when I was in Japan to preach the gospel and you reached out and saved my soul. And Lord, thank you for, as I look at each individual person in this room. We all have a story, a story where you used people to reach them with your love. Lord, help us as believers to grasp that concept, to realize that our main focus is to tell others about you. We pray for opportunities to do that this week. We pray, Lord, that if we have unconfessed sin, if there's something we've allowed to creep in into our lives, Lord, that we would get that right with you right now. Help us to confess that sin to you now and to make it right with the other person as soon as possible. Lord, help us to have a kingdom focus. We pray for Pastor Mike as he's preaching at Eastview this morning. That, Lord, that you would bring the increase there, that souls would be saved and lives would be changed. Lord, we're thankful for the four baptisms that we have scheduled for this morning and the ten that we were able to do last week. That's only because of your grace. Lord, may we never get complacent. May we never get self-righteous and think, look what we're doing. May we always give you the glory and give you the honor. We pray for those that are at home who are unable to be here, whether through sickness or deployment. Lord, that you would be alongside them, that they would comfort them. Lord, help us as we sing and as we pray and as we listen to your word today to be different because we've spent time with you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's stand and sing. This peace slid out that darkness and hope that's in the flood. There's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ is one. So I can face tomorrow for tomorrow. Please be seated. We're doing something a little different today. We have a, a guest speaker today. And I had the privilege of uh, listening to Brother John Gordy at our last, uh, was it our last associational meeting or the one before that? It was just recently. We'll say recently. How's that? And Brother John uh, and his wife were missionaries on the mission field for over 38 years in Ghana and the Middle East and in China. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. Three children and ten grandchildren. I like that part. I have just got number seven, so we're trying to catch up to you, brother. Um, he is a mission catalyst, and the, 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 the state of North Carolina is broken into ten regions, and you have regions one and two, I believe. Uh, and I love the concept of a missions catalyst, and I'll let him kind of talk about that. But we have the privilege of listening to a missionary, and people say, well, that's no big deal. Well, it's amazing the kind of heroes that we set up for our children nowadays. 
people that play music or act in a movie or can throw a football so far. But I, I think Christians ought to look up to other Christians who God is using to, to get his work out there. Now, Brother John will be the first person to tell you it's not him, it's God. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So I would like for you to listen to uh, Brother John and his, um, his, 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 his Miss Pat, it's great to have you here. Um, and, and really try to get the, the, the heart of the message. And the heart of the message is the same thing that we had in Sunday school today. God loves people, even people like us. And so, uh, Brother John, if you would come, sir, and uh, give us God's word, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Brother. Yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Get myself organized here. Uh, good, good to see you. I love this church. Uh, actually, it's my first time to be in the church worship service, but uh, I spent uh, 10 weeks or so with Pastor Mike and uh, Pastor uh, Bud uh, doing some discipleship together, and so I've gotten to know uh, your pastor really well, so it's been, been a great time. Um, I hope today... Uh, that uh, you'll, you'll pray for me. Uh, before I came uh, over the last week, I've asked several people to be praying, praying for me, praying for Sin of You and uh, for our service today, for the earlier service and for the service today. Uh, I hope if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior that uh, you'll open up your heart that God, through the Holy Spirit of God, would speak to you and uh, you would come to trust Him by faith, by grace, you can be saved. And another thing, if uh, Pat and I served as missionaries a long time, now we're back over here uh, serving in the States. Uh, but I hope God calls out somebody here today, puts it on their heart to be a missionary, to be an international missionary, to go uh, overseas to reach people that may never have an opportunity to hear the gospel if you don't go. So if God puts that on your heart today, I hope you'll respond to that and also, one of the things in the Baptist State Convention, we've got 800 churches without pastors uh, in just in North Carolina. And so, you know, if God's working in your heart, old, young, men, doesn't matter. If God's working in your heart, calling you out, I hope you'll respond to that. We, there's a huge need for bivocational pastors, which probably means older pastors who want to keep working at their job, maybe don't want to move far off. But who could pastor a church and still work by vocationally? There's a huge need for that. So uh, just some ways to respond to the message today, and maybe God will speak to you in a different way, uh, but in some of those ways. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I want to get my phone out because I am mindful of time and um, want to get you out in time, time to eat. If you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, uh, John chapter 4, I want to talk about the whole uh, chapter, but I, I, I won't read all of that chapter. It's a very long chapter, but I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 10 and then verses 39 through 42. And everybody's familiar, I'm sure, with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, so we'll just be using that as our text today and seeking to draw out from that what God might be saying. Let me ask you to stand, if you don't mind, if you're able to, to stand and just honor God's Word and follow along as I read verses 1 through 10 and then 39 to 42. And I'll read quickly. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gathering and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God 
and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And then verse 39 uh, to 42. Um, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. When the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed two days. And because of his words, many more people believed. They said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves. And we know, know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Yeah. Whew. Just in passing here, you notice that they mentioned disciples at least three times. You know, Christianity is not just about conversion, but about making disciples who make disciples. And you notice in here they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. We believe now because we believe in Jesus. And so just put that in your mind. There's no uh, stepchildren in Christianity, no secondhand children, no uh, stepchildren. I'm not a child of God because my mother was or my father was. I'm a child of God because I've trusted in Jesus myself. So we no longer believe because of what somebody else said. We believe for ourselves. Um, John chapter 4 um, is a story that all of us are familiar with. But the gist of it is uh, Jesus came to save uh, all the peoples of the world. And the Bible makes this abundantly clear. For example, in John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of, of the world. And in Mark chapter 11, when Jesus was cleansing the temple, he drove out the money changers, and he proclaimed to them that his house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. So all nations. And one of the signs of his return in, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, one of the signs before I return is that this gospel will be proclaimed to all nations, all peoples. And then we're familiar with the Great Commission where Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, all nations. And then in Acts 1.8, we're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So ever expanding uh, places of influence. And then in Revelation 7, 9, we get a picture of what that will look like in heaven. It says that I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could, not, could count from every nation, every tongue, every people, every language, all standing before the throne of God. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the gospel is to go and be proclaimed to all the peoples throughout the world. Um, if you look at John chapter 4, our text for the day, you see the uh, has four movements. In verses 1 through 6, uh, Jesus takes his disciples to Samaria. Verses 7 through 26, Jesus has that long encounter with the Samaritan woman. And we'll get into more of that, but... I know you're familiar with that story. And then the third movement is verses 27 and 31 to 38, where Jesus or the disciples return after Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. And then the fourth movement of John chapter 4 is verse 39 through 42 that we read. And that's where Jesus is meeting and talking and conversing with uh, the people of the village of Sychar. And many came to know him on that occasion. Now, what is the central theme of John chapter 4? I suppose an argument can be made that there's more than one major theme in John chapter 4, but I believe the one that sticks out is that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Look at verse 42. We read that, but look at verse 42, and you'll get the central theme of this passage. They said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, but now, for now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is, what? He really is the Savior of the world. Um, when I was in school, I learned something about parables that's always helped me. 
Jesus uh, always puts the a punchline in a parable, or usually puts the punchline of a parable at the end. And um, so you get his meaning. If you go to the end of that parable, you'll get, you know, something of the meaning of that parable. I think it applies, too, to this story. It's not a parable, but it's a story uh, that Jesus punched the punchline at the end. What is he getting at? He's getting at that Jesus himself is the Savior of the world. It's interesting, too, that the disciples didn't see this. They didn't say that. They didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? Jesus himself didn't say that about himself. Jesus' closest relatives, his mother, his brothers, his in-laws, never said that about him. But who said that about Jesus? It was the Samaritans. Isn't that interesting? Jesus or the Samaritans said, Jesus or this man is the Savior of the world. And I don't mean, and I know you don't believe that either, Jesus is, it's universalism where at the end everybody's going to be saved, we're all going to be okay, it doesn't matter what you believe and all of that. No, I don't believe that. I'm, I know you, I'm confident you don't believe that. But I mean in universalism that the gospel needs to be heard around the world to every people group, to every nation. Every person needs an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. Some of them may say no. Some of them may refuse to listen, not be willing to listen. Uh, but our responsibility as Christians and as churches, our responsibility is to get the gospel to them, give them an opportunity to hear clearly, sometimes in their own language, to hear the gospel and have an opportunity to respond. That's what the Bible's talking about here. Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of everybody who will put their faith in Him and believe. By grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So anybody, anywhere, with any language, any color, any ethnicity can believe in Jesus. Amen? So that's universalism I'm talking about, and that's universalism you agree with. We need to give everybody an opportunity. And I know this church does a better job than most churches. I've looked at your map, missions map out in the hall, where you've got lines going many places around the world. And even our son is being uh, supported uh, by your church here. He's in Nairobi, Kenya. Jesus is the Savior of the world. But let me ask you this. If you believe that, then Two things also must be true about you. If you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, then number one, and I've only got two points here, short sermon, right? The first point is, if you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, you must be willing to take the gospel to difficult places. Get your passport. Now, if you can't go, you can support people who can go. And if you can't go, you can give money to your, through your church coffers, through the offering, uh, through the cooperative program, IBM, whatever, Lottie Moon. If you can go, you can pray, or you can give to go to those difficult places. If you get this story of the Samaritan woman, Jesus was down in Judea. And he wanted to go back again to Galilee. If you look at a map, it's kind of, he was at the bottom, wanted to go to the top. Well, in between Judea and Galilee was Samaria. And that's where Jesus wanted to go. But most Jews, I would say 99.999% of Jews never went that way. They would rather cross over the indirect way. You could cross over the Jordan River you could go up through Perea, bypass Samaria, and cross back over at the top and go to Galilee. That's how they went. You know why they went there, right? Uh, the Samaritan woman nailed it. She said, well, you Jews, y'all have no dealings with us, right? So most Jews would go up that way. But Jesus went the direct way. He went from Judea up to Galilee. He passed right through Samaria. The Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And that Greek word there, I'm not a Greek scholar. I know Brother Mike is, maybe Brother Mark is, but I'm not, but I can look it up. And that Greek word there for must is the word die. You know, not English die, but Greek die. 
Uh, and it means he, he had to. It was a must. It, it was necessary. It, he was not forced, but he was committed to going through Samaria. Why was he that way? Why was that that way? Well, Jesus didn't have to do most things. The Bible says he must be about his father's business. He must go to Jerusalem and be crucified. He must do the work of the father who sent him while it is day because the night coming cometh when no man can work. There are some things that Christ must do, uh, not that many. But here's another one. He must go through Samaria. Now, there are other ways to go, like I mentioned. You know, he could cross over and go up, bypass Samaria, but he must go through Samaria. Why did he have that must? Well, the Bible says the reason he came was to seek and save that which was lost. Maybe he had a divine appointment there. I don't understand all the foreknowledge of God, and you know, but you know, probably he knew that the Samaritan woman was going to be there at that time, sitting at the well, and he was going to meet her. He had a divine appointment there. Or he could have been taking those disciples. You know, they, they were slow learners. He was taking those 12 disciples on a short-term mission trip. I know many of you here have been on a short-term mission trip. How would you like to go on one with Jesus? <laughs> Man, I'd love that. So Jesus was taking them. I mean, they, they didn't want to go to Samaria. They were Jews. You know, they said, we don't have any dealings with those guys. Jesus said, we're going through Samaria. Short-term mission trip. Taking the gospel to difficult places. Jesus chose to do that. Um, why was that? Well, when Jesus went to Samaria, uh, remember he crossed these barriers. Uh, he crossed cultural barriers. He crossed racial barriers. He crossed prejudicial barriers, uh, gender barriers, educational barriers, religious barriers, safety, comfort barriers, economic barriers. On and on it goes. Jesus crossed all of those barriers to take the gospel to a difficult place. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself, are you crossing any barriers? Cultural, religious, educational barriers. Safety barriers, economic barriers, prejudicial barriers, ethnicity barriers to get the gospel to somebody. Jesus crossed all of those when he went to Samaria. You know, lots of reasons not to go to Samaria. Um, like the woman at the well said, you Jews have no dealings with us. What are you doing here? <laughs> kind of. Um, as a part of that trail from uh, Judea to Galilee that was called the Trail of Blood uh, by scholars. It's where a lot of uh, robberies, uh, killings took place. And if they passed through there, they could be ceremonially unclean because they had come in close contact with the Samaritans. But Jesus wanted to take the gospel to a difficult place. Brothers and sisters, if you believe the Bible, and if you believe what the Samaritan says, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, then one of the things you must be willing to do is take the gospel to difficult places. You know, the easy places have already been reached. I, I know there's lost people everywhere. I talked to somebody after church today that asked me to pray for one of their relatives, and Pat and I have relatives that are lost. I know, I know here in North Carolina, I work in North Carolina, and I know all over there's lost people. But man, can you think of the lost people in the world that have never had an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel? When Pat and I served in China, we did ask people about Jesus, and they, they were not kidding when they said, who? Who is that? Who, who is that? Never seen a Bible, never heard a gospel presentation, probably never met a Christian. We need to take the gospel to
to the difficult places. That's the reason Jesus went through Samaria. There was one time in our missionary service that uh, 80% of the missionaries, including the IMB, uh, I love the IMB, but I am not blind to some of the things that we need to work on. Even the IMB and other mission agencies were sending 80% of their missionary personnel to the most reached places of the world and overlooking the 20 and just sending 20% of the people to unengaged, unreached people who had never heard the gospel. I was listening to Open Doors recently, and they said that there's 10 countries in the world that's the most difficult to be a Christian. In North Korea, Yemen, Somalia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Iraq, Libya, Eritrea, Afghanistan, and Sudan. I don't know if there's missionaries working there or not, uh, but I know that those are some of the most difficult places to be, but probably some of the greatest needs in the whole world are to get the gospel there. When Pat and I served in, our first service was in Ghana, in West Africa, and, uh, you know, very, very lovely country, very friendly country, but we got caught in a difficult situation there. We were green. Uh, we'd only been there like a year. We didn't know much. We didn't know language very well. <clears throat> and uh, I'd, hurt, I'd hurt my finger by, on a pineapple. I was peeling a pineapple the wrong way, and I got pricked by one of the thorns and uh, got infected. And it was bad. I mean, I was going to the doctor every week, and he would cut it, lance it, let it drain, give me antibiotics, on and on it went. And <clears throat> one Sunday morning, I woke up, and it was particularly bad. It was, it was inflamed and red streaks shooting up my arm. My wife's a nurse, and so I showed it to her, and she said, well, that's, that's not good. And uh, <laughs> I said, doesn't feel good. She said, you need to go to the doctor. I said, but Sunday morning, and we were supposed to go to church. And uh, she said, no, let's leave the children here. We need to go to, to see the doctor. And we were hearing uh, what turned out to be gunfire, uh, big gunfire. I mean, I, we, I, we, we were green. Uh, I was not a Marine. We heard the gunfire. We didn't know what it was. We started to cross town. We know it's kind of eerie out here, not many people out. And, uh, but I had this thumb, and the doctor had his office in his house, so we knew he'd be home. So got there, knocked on the door, and he came to the door like, man, what are you doing here? He said, he said there's a military coup going on. He said, you need to get home. He said, I was on the golf course, and he said, there's a bullets flying around out there. And then we were really scared because we didn't know that. We left our children way across town. Uh, and I said, well, my thumb. And he said, okay, he wrapped it up a little bit. He said, y'all go home. Be careful. Well, on the way home, we were tense because we knew, you know, that there's a coup going on. Nobody on the street. We were the only car. This is the capital city. I mean, when was the penny going to drop? So we were on our way home, and we got it within like a mile of our house, and uh, we came up over a rise, and down on the ground was a soldier, camouflage. I don't know if he was a loyal soldier or one of the coup makers, but he was spraying bullets just all around, one of those automatic weapons. Well, we, if we'd have kept going, we'd have run into the, him and those bullets, or we'd have got shot. So I pulled off the road, didn't say a word to Pat. She didn't say a word to me. We were just terrified. She jumped out that side. I got out this side. We rolled down this big bank, got down to the bottom. We saw Africans over in the African huts, and they were giving it this. Come, come over here. Come over here. So Pat and I got up, ran, got inside one of those huts, and we stayed there for, it seemed like forever. Helicopters flying over, gunfire going off, sounds like a, uh, Bombs or hand grenades going off everywhere. It was terrible. And uh, we heard the radio blasting, sometimes in English, sometimes in the local language. We didn't know what all they were saying, but one time we're in charge, next time no, we're in charge, and on and on it went. Finally, things settled down, and they sent policemen through this village. And he was going from house to house, and he would get to one house, and he'd say, everybody inside, come out. And uh, he would shoot off this gun, you know, boom, in the air, come out. And uh, so finally he got to where we were, and uh, I thought, well, 
everybody in there come out. So we all came out. Our African brothers and sisters came out, and the only two Caucasian people with a thousand miles came out of that house. And it frightened that policeman. Uh, I guess he thought that we were a part of this military coup. And uh, so I started walking toward him, and I knew a little language, not very much, but I knew how to beg. If you go overseas, learn how to beg. Mi pacho, mi pacho, mi pacho. And I was walking, walking toward him, mi pacho, I beg you. And I got a little closer to him. He said, stop, don't come in, folks. Don't, don't come toward me. And uh, I, thought, I thought he was going to shoot me. I looked behind me, and Pat was up against the hut, you know, like spread eagle like that. And I thought he was going to shoot me, maybe shoot her. And uh, about that time, there was a man that stepped forward, forward, and he said to that policeman, he said, I know these two people. They're not a part of this coup. Uh, they're missionaries. And he said, let me take them. And so the policeman, just with his rifle, just says, go. And uh, so William took us, and we left our car. We started walking. We were a couple of miles from home. We took some back roads and got home, and our children were okay. Uh, but on the way home, I asked this man, I said, who are you? He said, I'm William. I said, I, I said, we've never met before. How did you say you knew me? I said, I don't know you. He said, well, I saw your car up on the hill, and it said Baptist Mission on the side. And he said, uh, so I knew you were a missionary. And uh, I said, well, tell, tell me more about that. And he said, well, he said, when I was a little boy going to school, uh, missionaries paid my school fees uh, and sent me to school. He said, I couldn't afford to go to school, and they paid my fees. And he said, I ended up living with this missionary family. And I said, well, what did they do? And he said, well, the missionary family was a church planter. And uh, so for several years, I worked with him planting churches. I told William this story. I said, you know, for the last three months uh, that I've been in this country or longer, I said, I've got a little prayer closet I've been going in, and I've been asking God to teach me how to plant churches because I was called a church planter, but I didn't know how to plant churches. I'd been a pastor and never planted the churches before I went overseas. And I'd been praying God. Uh, I'm going to have to go home. The missionaries are looking at me, or looking for me. I'm supposed to be a church plant. I'm supposed to be teaching them how to plant churches. God, you've got to teach me how to do this, or we're going to go home. God answered that prayer with William. Uh, William said, uh, well, I, I can help you. He said, that's what I used to do for the other missionary. And so we planted, the first church I ever planted was in that village where we rode down the bank uh, called Achimota. Atsumoto Baptist Church, still there today, I believe, and William helped me plant that. He, what he had learned from that other missionary that had long gone, uh, William taught me, you know, how to plant churches. We planted eight churches uh, in Ghana. Uh, William didn't help me with all of them, but he helped me with a couple of those until I got that kind of experience under my belt, and then I was able to train African brothers uh, to, to, to do that. Going to difficult places. Uh, you know, that, that was a bit of a difficult spot. Uh, but God used all of that uh, to reach that difficult place. So if you believe that the gospel is for the whole world, you need to be willing to go to difficult places. And then number two, just two points, right? Then you've got to be willing to go to difficult people. Boy, that's what Jesus did. Look at the Samaritan woman. I mean, sometimes when I read about her, I just say, wow, what a woman. I mean, she was in great, great struggles, great, great difficulties. Uh, she said that uh, she was in a crisis. She was in a family crisis. She went to that well not because she wanted to go by herself. She went to that well probably because everybody in her family had ostracized her uh, because she had such a reputation. She was there by herself, the scholars believe, in the heat of the day, like high noon, because she had a family crisis. She had a spiritual crisis. She 
knew about water, but she did not know about eternal water. She did not know about the spiritual water that Jesus was soon to introduce to her. She was in a religious crisis. She told Jesus, she said, well, I know about religion. I know we worship on that mountain over there, but her religion had not led her to a personal relationship with God. And she had a moral crisis. She had had, had five husbands, and the husband that she's living, in, living with now was not really her husband. She was a difficult woman. Now, I'm not criticizing her. But, I mean, how many of you could say, but by the grace of God, that's me? I mean, I could say that, right? But by the grace of God, that's me, right? A difficult person, a difficult woman. But that's the reason Jesus went to that Samaritan village, to see that difficult woman. You know that um, when we lived in China, uh, there were a group of Chinese trying to take the gospel back to Jerusalem. They called it B2J, back to Jerusalem. And the reason they were trying to go back to Jerusalem, if you go from China back toward Jerusalem, you cross the Buddhist world, and then you cross the Hindu world, and then you cross the Muslim world, and then you cross the Jewish world. Difficult places with difficult people to reach for Christ. When Pat and I lived in China, uh, we went there because I heard a Chinese giving a testimony that uh, there were 30,000 Chinese coming to Christ every day in mainland China. Uh, my father called it Red China, right? <laughs> Remember those days? 30,000 people. Do you know that the day will come soon that there'll be more Christians in China than in the USA? Now, percentage-wise, that's still small because they got 1.8 billion or something like that. But the day is going to come if the church, the underground church in China keeps growing like it is, 30,000 a day, there's going to come a time when there's more Christians in that communist country than here. When Pat and I lived in China, we lived there 12 years, and uh, man, when we first got there, <clears throat> we didn't know any Chinese. I mean, not, not Chinese people, Chinese language. We didn't know either one. And um, so we were staying in a hotel, and we were trying to find our way around. It was so bad that the hotel we were staying in, we told them we wanted to go to visit a mountain, a tourist site. It was so bad that they made a sign and put it on us and said, please take me to Lushan Mountain in Chinese. And then he flipped it over, please take me back to my hotel. <laughs> I, think, I think we still got that sign. That's how bad it was. We, we couldn't do anything. You know, it's like the children out here when they come in to register for nursery, you know, get, get a, oh, we didn't know anything. We would go to the store and look at bottles and shake bottles to try to figure out what's inside that bottle. Can we eat that? Uh, we were at a shop and Pat had bought uh, a bunch of groceries and uh, she went to the checkout counter to the teal and uh, the lady couldn't understand her. Pat couldn't understand the lady behind the cash register and, and it was a mess. And uh, Pat was trying to buy this. The lady said, I don't know what you're talking about. And, so anyhow, uh, we couldn't pay. I'd gone upstairs, and a little Chinese woman in front of Pat or behind her, I don't remember, said, Hi, uh, <clears throat> I speak a little English. Can I help you? And uh, Pat said, Yes, please. I'm trying to buy these items. I got some money, but I don't know how to do this. And so the lady got it all sorted out, and <clears throat> they started walking out, and the lady said, My name is Merrill. And she told Pat, she said, uh, <clears throat> And I'm pregnant. Now, that's an interesting conversation, right? My name's Merrill, and I'm pregnant. Uh, she said, I haven't even told my husband. She said, there's a little hospital across the street here, and I just been over there, found out that I'm pregnant, came here to buy some stuff to go home. She said, I'm going to tell him when I get home, but you're the first person. And in China, they had one-child policy. So a child was a big deal. You know, If you can only have one, that's, that's extra special, right? So she told Pat, and they started coming upstairs, and I was upstairs at the escalator at the top, and 
she came up and then she looked at me and she said, uh, hi, my, my, my name is Meryl. She said, I'm a Christian. Are you? Now, remember, I'm the missionary, right? <laughs> and I was a, a bit afraid to answer her because, you know, you can't be a missionary in mainland China. And uh, I said, uh, she said, are you a Christian? And I finally said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Then she said, I want to be baptized. Can you baptize me? I thought, man, this is a trap, sure enough. I haven't been in the country 10 days, and they're going to kick me out of here. But I looked at her, and I said, yes, I can baptize you. And she started poking me in the chest. She said, I'm the only Christian in my family. And she said, you are going to help me win my family to Christ. Man, I don't know why God sent us to China, but I know there's one reason. Meryl, poking me in the chest. You know, we we helped, we saw, sometimes we shared the gospel with her husband who was a communist hardliner, became a Christian. Her son that she named after me after that meeting, she named him Johnny. He became a Christian. He's working in the States now at Amazon. Her mother, who was a strong Buddhist, who used to go up to the second floor of her house and have a seance. Now, I don't know what a Buddhist seance is, but she used to go up there with her sister, and they would pray, and according to them, they would talk to other dead relatives that had gone on somewhere. She became a believer. Her sister, who refused to believe, let her two children believe in Christ. Her father-in-law, who chased me, almost chased me and Pat out of his village because I was passing out Jesus films. And he said, I'm the Communist Party leader in this village. You cannot do that in this village. And made me promise to stop. But we didn't stop. He became a Christian. And I couldn't believe it. When Merrill called to tell us that he had become a believer, I just, I could not believe it. Brothers and sisters, difficult people. But if you believe the gospel, if you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, like the Samaritan said, if you believe that, then you've got to take the gospel to the difficult places and to the difficult people. Now, you may have difficult people in your family. We've got some. Every day, God is my witness. Well, almost every day, I'm praying, God, let her come to herself and come to you. Difficult places, difficult people. Not always overseas. And then finally, let me close here. The results of taking the gospel to difficult places and to difficult people. There's a negative thing here that I saw. Uh, If you look in your Bibles, in verses 8 through 27, you'll see verse 8, the disciples left Jesus, went to town to get food, and they didn't come back to verse 27. So I counted them, 19 verses. I don't know the answer to that. I'm looking for some New Testament scholar to tell me the answer to this. But why did it take 12 disciples to go buy food? And they missed Jesus talking about the living water, the water that springs up to eternal life. They missed it. They missed Jesus talking about the kinds of worshipers that God wants, that worship him in spirit and in truth. They missed Jesus saying, I'm the Messiah. The disciples didn't know that. The Samaritan woman said, I know there's a Messiah coming. Jesus said, you are speaking to him. 
Man, the disciples missed those things. And much, much more. 19 verses later, they come back. And my challenge to the church is, you know, what are you missing? By not going to difficult places and among the difficult people. You know, stay in lockstep with Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, you know, we sing that song, wherever he leads, I'll go. Do you really mean that? Don't be off buying food. Stay with Jesus. The positive thing about this is there was a great, 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 great harvest. Difficult place, difficult people. And you would think, it's not going to work. I can, hear, I can hear us talking about it now. Not going to work. Not going to work. But it did. If you look in verse 39, it says, When the woman got back and she told them they believed, it says, verse 39, many believed. And then verse 41, they changed that and said, Oh, well, many more believed. Not because of what the woman said, but because they had seen Jesus too. Brothers and sisters, if you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, then you must do these two things. Take the gospel to difficult places. Take the gospel to difficult people. And the Bible says you will reap a harvest. I mean, there's a big harvest here. Great, great harvest. Well, let's pray together. Lord, what a privilege to be standing in this pulpit today, Lord, where Pastor Mike, Pastor Mark often stand and preach the Word of God. And Lord, I'm humbled to stand where they've stood. And but Lord, I know that we preach the same gospel. Lord, I pray for decisions today, Lord, that need to be made to be saved. Uh, to answer the call to missions, to answer a call to vocational ministry, to answer a call to be baptized, to answer a call to go to difficult places and serve among difficult people, and or to even intensify our prayer for a loved one, Lord, a lost loved one, difficult person, maybe. But to intensify our prayer, Lord, to never give up as long as we have breath, never give up. Lord, would you move in a special way today and in this invitation time, would you pull, as you say in your word, on hearts of people to respond. And as I responded when I was young to that song, don't go away without Jesus in your heart. And I pray in your name, amen. As you heard the invitation, you are welcome to come. If you want to talk afterwards, we'd be glad to do that as well. Please stand. I give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus. Please be seated just for a minute as we do a few baptisms this morning. If you were here last week, you remember uh, Chaplain Bruno had the privilege of baptizing his son, Josiah. And today he has the privilege of baptizing his daughter, Abigail. 
Brother, if you would speak, go ahead. Morning, church. Yeah, this is my daughter, Abigail, and I'm going to embarrass her just for a minute by saying nice things about her. Um, her name means my father's joy, and she is a joy. She has been uh, from the day she's been born, and we, my wife and I, we really thought really long and hard about her name because, and some of you guys are familiar with the story in the Bible of Abigail. She, uh, she was a very wise and discerning woman who saved her people from the hand of David because of her husband Nabal. And so Abigail, we, when we name our children, sometimes we want, we want them to, to emulate what those names mean and, the, and, the, and what those people in the Bible did. And so today she's dis, she has discerned her, that God wants her to have a relationship through her son, through his son, Jesus Christ. And so she is wise, and she is discerning, and she's everything that a father could ever want in a daughter. So I get to baptize my, my little girl today. And so thank you guys for being here and for supporting that. So Abigail, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you commit to following him all the days of your life with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Yes. And Abigail, based on your proclamation of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you as my daughter and now as my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And there's more. Don't forget to pick up your children. Lord, thank you for the great message that we hear today. Thank you for the privilege of watching three souls be baptized. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to remind us of your love for us. And then you give us the privilege of telling others about that. May we not take that lightly. May we see it as a privilege and give us opportunities this week to reach difficult people in difficult places.